Good morning. I want to thank you, David, for inviting me to this most fascinating several days. It's not the sort of thing that I'm normally uh, invited to, but I'm delighted to be here. Um, I want to talk about the role of open space in development, but, but particularly in redevelopment. There was a very interesting uh, psychological uh, experiment developed at Stanford University in 1970. And what it amounted to was to take a group of kids, give them a marshmallow, and tell them they could go ahead and eat the marshmallow. But if they would wait 15 minutes, they would get two marshmallows. Now, what was interesting about this is subsequent studies showed that the ones who could wait did better socially, did better in school, and actually made more money. Now, I think a lot of times when we are doing development, we're very worried about money, we're very worried about getting things going, but we often select the first marshmallow. Now, that hasn't always been true. In the late uh, 19th century, Central Park and Golden Gate Park in San Francisco set aside land, which could perhaps have been developed, maybe not at that time, but eventually. And the idea was that you didn't, um, you didn't just set that land aside as some kind of uh, duty, um, but it actually valued the land around it. It produced more value. And so rather than seeing public open space as a subtraction, it needs to be seen as one of the things that will produce the value. Now, Grant Park in Chicago uh, is perhaps the greatest one in the United States where a waterfront, which people would love to develop, would love to maximize, and therefore privatize, was set back, and then the whole downtown faced that park and then the water. Now, this was not just, the park was not just something for the citizens, although it is that, but it also produced a setting which made the development more important, more valuable. Now, there are some modern examples. Some of them you've heard about in the conference today. Um, this is the New York High Line, which was built on a, a, an abandoned elevated rail line, which runs across and uh, touches uh, Hudson Yards, which we heard about yesterday. And the interesting thing about this is this park, separated from the ground and being largely a pedestrian movement, has produced an incredible amount of development in Chelsea, which had seen no development at all except for some art galleries. So this is a very interesting experiment of how open space can change people's view of a place. We were criticized in New York for uh, giving seven and a half acres to the 9-11 memorial. But what people forget is that there's over $15 billion worth of development that has been done in just a few years. We're two buildings short of having all the land used again at much higher levels. The Brooklyn Bridge Park, which was also mentioned the other day, was built along a series of old piers. Not much on the land, actually. And this land had been sitting pretty much derelict since the Second World War. And the land behind it had also been sitting pretty much derelict. And it had lots of problems the way all redevelopment areas do. But just the beginning of that park has started to energize the area behind. First, it was buildings that were there and were retrofitted to higher uses. And now it's new buildings that are going up that are using that. Now, this site is right on the water and is looking across at the Manhattan skyline. Can you imagine a piece of ground that was more valuable? But it took the park to kind of get people to see it as use useful and as uh, desirable from the point of view of users. Now, when we started Barangaroo, Paul Keating, who most of you know was the former prime minister, uh, talked to us about this. And he said he wanted to, to see if we could make uh, something that would be an aboriginal cultural center. And he further said that he didn't think that it was really appropriate that we build that center 
out of marble and glass and so forth, that it just seemed like the wrong thing. And what he asked us at the very beginning, one of the most interesting questions that's ever been asked, I've ever been asked, is could you make a monumental piece of landscape that would count in the metropolitan area, be different from other things, but represent a completely different attitude toward commemoration? And he suggested that we go back and look at this thing historically. And you can see what it looked like. This was sort of what it was like when the Europeans came. This was Miller's point when the Europeans came. And he pointed out that there were uh, five headlands around here. And, and in the center, there was Goat Island. And these headlands and Goat Island and the harbor formed the place that the Aborigines Aborigines lived here and fished. Now, all of those headlands are still there except for Miller's Point, except the one we were dealing with. And that had been taken away during the period when, when they were coring uh, stone to build the city, and then ultimately had, had ended up uh, being the basis for a, a container port, which all of Barangaroo is a huge sheet of concrete. So how do you go about that? Well, we, we started looking at what we had as a record of what that headland was like. And we took these drawings. There were, no, there were no surveys. There were no topographic maps. And we took those and generated them into a kind of survey form. And then using computer modeling, we made that form into something that could have been the headland. Now, you can see where the headland used to be, the red line. And then this is what was given us, and then this was the container port. So the thing is, we wanted to fill this in and essentially bring this back. Now, the other thing uh, that we did, because this had been an, an area that had been separated, um, is we took a look at the whole city. And the first thing we found, which was really interesting, is that there was a continuous walk from McCrary's, Mrs. McCary's chair to the Botanic Garden, around, around the Opera House, uh, around Circular Quay, and then, and then it stopped at the container port. And then it picked up, and it went from King's Wharf all the way around Darling Harbor and then over to Piermont. Now, that piece had been missing for years and years and years. Why is it important? Well, today, particularly in urban recreation, Linear recreation is very highly prized. I mean, how many of you jog? How many of you ride bikes? How many of you go out and walk? Um, how many take, take your kids for a walk? That's the kind of activity that is, that is popular in urban life. So we had the opportunity of, complete, of completing that line. The other thing we did was we looked at the whole city, both in terms of automobile movement in blue, but most importantly, the red lines are pedestrian movement. And if we couldn't pick these things up, then this would still stay a separate thing from the city. Because we still, except for the headland, we, we had a 60-foot six, cliff all along here. We also looked down. We found that underneath the concrete of the uh, container port, there was still uh, sandstone. So we set up a quarry, see it here and started taking stone out. And we used that stone to make the new edge of a new configuration of the headland part of the park. Now, they very carefully made this quarry in such a way that they could drop a three-story parking garage in there. So it, it became the site of the parking garage, so we didn't have to fill it in with dirt at the end. Now, this shows that walkway along the, the foreshore, all the way along not just in the headland, but also all the way down to uh, past the uh, southern area. And this is divided, the, the Barangaroo is divided into three basic uh, parts. This is the headland, this is the central park, and this is uh, Barangaroo South. The uh, northern cove was built in like this, partly to articulate the headland, along with a little cove at Moore's Wharf, but also to try and set this aside to make it something special. Again, trying to build this up into something special. Here's, a, here's the design of the park. This is the walkway you can see going through. This is the Headland Park. 
This is the Central Park, and this is what we call the downtown area, Brangaroo South. Now, these are pictures up on the headland. We're, we're planting on the western and the southern side of the headland uh, a, a real bush, not just with natives from Australia, but natives from, from Sydney. Down at the base of the headland is this walk, which goes all the way around, connects a few uh, little parks and beaches. If you go up on top of the headland and you look out, this is the view you're going to have. If you go down to the bottom of the headland and look back up, you will see yourself looking out if you're standing here. Now, Central's a little different. There's the, there's the finished headland park. And this is across, this is, the, this is the northern cove, and this is a boardwalk which runs all the way to King's Wharf. This is a pedestrian uh, way, a shaded pedestrian way, that also goes all the way to King's Wharf. This is looking north in the, in the center of the park. We call it a, an activities green. I'll talk about that a little bit more. A little hill here, which allows places for people to sit and look at various venues. And this is a, this is a picture looking uh, south toward uh, Barangaroo South, uh, trying to keep these things all connected. Now, the other thing we've done with Barangaroo Central is that we've d used a thing called programming. That's a very popular thing. Um, Federation Square in Melbourne is programmed. Uh, so is Bryant Park. Federation Square is basically a hard square. It's all paved. And Bryant Park is a, basically a green park. And this programming, which brings activities, regular activities, to, to it, has made this the second most popular park in New York. Just behind Central Park, this is seven acres, and Central Park is almost 1,000 acres. And it's this programming which has generated this interest. These are the kinds of activities that go on in that little seven-acre park. And we see Central that same way. However, we want to do it within the framework of a green park, so the continuation uh, isn't so jarring. You don't, you don't move from the headland to something hard. You move from it to something which is soft and friendly. Between the new development in Central and the Central Park, we proposed a walking street like this, a sort of ramblas. And this is a transition from the development here, which is going to be very intense, to the park here, which is going to be much quieter, with a series of commercial retail pop-ups along here, allowing you to see, when you're going along the walking street, allowing you to see out into the park and the various things that are happening there. In South, we have two major spaces. We have what we call the Hicks and Oval here, and a walk, a walk all the way along the waterfront. Now, these, these haven't been easy. Here's what we see as the oval. It's basically a playground. Here's the walk along the front. Now, I mentioned these connections. We think these connections are really important. The first one I want to show you is a connection right here off Hickson Road. And you come off Hickson Road into what we're calling a cultural plaza. And it's a real park plaza. It's not a hard surface. If you go to the right, you go into uh, the Headland Park. If you go to the left, you go down to the Central Park. So it becomes one of the major entries uh, onto the park. It also will be the only place along Hickson Road that you can see the water because the northern cove has been brought in so that you can actually see from the street to the waterfront. Two others, this is Towns Place. This is where we imagine the buses uh, and the uh, cars to come, and this is also the entrance to the parking garage right here. That sits here. And then another, which comes from the rocks, through the Argyle Cut, it's a pedestrian entrance, and you enter the park through here, and this, this would be for all the people who are living in the rocks. It's a short walk to come over. Perhaps the most dramatic one is what we're calling the Sydney Steps. And this goes up through the development and connects the park and the waterfront all the way up to Kent Street. And this particular image of it, we see it as a great st stone staircase with a cascade running down. Um, and the cascade can be turned off, and this can be a, an informal amphitheater with a stage down in this area. And this will, again, cut through the, uh, the commercial development. Now, 
One of the things we're hoping here is that we can do something with enough bravura to be an important place inside the city. I mean, we're reaching for something uh, spatially and physically important. Now look, a lot of the things that I've been talking about in Barangaroo are unique to Barangaroo. They do not need to move and do another one somewhere else. In fact, I would prefer that not happen. But that may not still mean that we can't learn anything from our experience in Barangaroo, and it's been quite an experience. So I wanted to suggest a few things that you might think about in the bays which come out of our experience in Barangaroo. The first one is to look back. Before the, before the quarrying and what this was like then. And particularly look at the patterns of development, the early patterns of development, and to try and figure out what, why people like to live up there, why they went up there, what were the values that they, what, were, what did they receive by living up there. The second thing is we thought that this area, and we think that this area that is studied is not just phase one and phase two, but it's this whole area. Because we have a whole series of people who live in this area, who've already developed this area, and who, who have, feel a tremendous value for, for their places they are living. And so this needs to be extended so that you don't look at it as the project and the neighbors, that sort of thing. I heard some of the neighbors yesterday. The other thing is we might look down. Uh, originally, these areas down by the fish market and over here and Glebe Island is where the stone came from to build the city. In the 30s, bricks came along and they were a lot cheaper than the stone to build with. So the stone gave way and they closed the quarries. And when you walk around down there, you're not walking around on modern industrial space, you're walking around on top of quarries, that flattening of the quarries. But the point I think that's important is that the stone is still under there and, and can be, and can be uh, used. Now, how can you use it? Well, the first way, of course, is it's tremendously valuable. Bricks are still good, but yellow block is worth its weight in gold. And that is a, that is a business. That you, can, you can get cash flow out of that. And during the long period of doing the infrastructure, you're going to need cash. And this is a place that cash can come from. It can be done in a whole series of smaller increments. The second, of course, is that you could get stone out of there to do modifications, perhaps in Glebe Island, perhaps some of the waterfront areas. The third is that if you calculate it, this could be essentially your excavation for all the parking. If you're going to develop the area in higher densities, you're going to have to put the cars somewhere. And you already, do, you already have a shortage of cars at the fish market. So this is a chance to put those underground and use this process in several ways. And the last is that there is some contamination, and I think the excavation can deal with that and pay for some of the removal of contamination. The next is the old quarrying produced a series of, of cliffs, just like uh, in Barangaroo. It's the same, same proposition. But people live now up here. And so I think the space between the cliff and the water is extraordinarily important in how it's handled. You don't want to do something in here, maximizing its yield, and then destroying value that's already there. So you want to add to the value, not trade one value for another. Now the views are really important. That's why a lot of people live up here. That's why they love to live up here. And these view sheds are really important. So that if you have views out down and over the water and down and over the, the new development, you will have protected something that is really valuable. Glebe Island is kind of interesting because it's right in the middle of the view shed. Everybody is going to look down on it. By the same token, everyone has water between them and Glebe Island. So it's an interesting possibility of how that development could take place. Some institutional or higher level use, even higher building could take place and, and Glebe Island, and not harm any of the people who live up above. This has been mentioned several times in this conference. It's not my idea, but right now, at the very beginning of the planning process, is the time to set aside this continuous walkway, which could be connected back to Darling Harbor. 
Now, that doesn't all have to be green park. It can be boardwalks, it can be commercial areas, it can be retail areas, but it has to stay a permanent right-of-way in the public realm. If you build one building right there, let's say, you'll break that chain and you'll reduce the value of the linearity way, way down. The next thing is that because of both the quarrying and then the, and then the uh, uh, industrial development, these areas have lost their connection to the water. And the planning needs to do it itself in such a way that they gain again access to the water. That will increase the value of the people here in the new improved waterfront and the park and so forth, that, if they can come down. And I don't mean just visually. I mean pedestrian-wise and wherever possible, we should be able to get cars down there. Essentially stitch this area back into the pattern of the, of the existing. Bringing ferries in, that's, that's mentioned, and this is just an example. Bringing a ferry all the way down the fish market. I heard yesterday that the ferries aren't important in, in numbers of delivery of people, but they are important to Sydney. I mean, you all, I mean, that's one of the great glories of Sydney. So I think bringing that down in, at least to here, would be important. The next thing is I would encourage you not to be timid about the shape of the water or the shape of the ground. This is a time when tremendous value can be made by some, of, some reshaping. There are places that are almost not navigable down here, and there are places that are less navigable down here. I think Glebe Island could certainly be redone to make it something much more attractive, attractive not just in itself, but attractive for development. And then I think the surface of the water could be put into a series of marinas and moorages, which would very inexpensively transform one's view of that place. It's not to say that the industrial movement is, is bad. Some of that's going to be there for a long time. But it does mean that you can, you can bring a whole new way of looking at what now is a completely industrial waterfront. Now, what I've tried to suggest is that you not think of open space as something you're giving up some development area that you then can't develop. Open space used properly in some of the ways I've been suggesting will enhance not just the existing people who live up in the existing neighborhoods, but also development itself and can bring value to that. And when you start thinking about how difficult it is to raise money and how quickly you want to get development going, think of marshmallows. Thank you. <laughs>